Good evening. If we could settle in and get ready for tonight's service. Just a reminder, if you have a cell phone, if you could please turn it off. I'll put it on silent so it doesn't disturb tonight's message. And if we could bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for another night where we can gather together here in peace and safety, Lord, in the building you provided for us around the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all your faithfulness to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we have the peace, Lord, that we get from your word, your faithfulness to us, and all the promises you give us, Lord, to sustain us in this world. Pray, Father, for tonight, for pastors, he brings forth your message. Pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to receive it. Pray, Father, we'd also be able to put aside all the cares and the details of this world, Father. It can get so busy. Pray you to settle us, Lord, and allow us to hear what the Spirit has for the church tonight. Pray for Pastor as he brings forth your word, Father, you would just speak mightily through him by the power of your Spirit. We pray for all those that couldn't make it here tonight, Father, you would just be with them, comfort them. Just give them all the grace that they need, Father, to continue on this path, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen. If we could stand and praise the Lord.
today He will make a way He will make a way Oh God will make a way Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see have one announcement Friday night men come on out it's the men's ministry at town hall lanes in Johnston that'll be at 545 if you can get there then and we can uh, start the game at 6 if you're interested that's the men's meeting on Friday and there will be no service here on Friday as well there'll be no service with that said children and teachers can be dismissed to class and now it's my honor and privilege tonight to introduce our pastor Pastor John Ritchie. Hey Amen. I'd like you to take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Job, chapter 2. We're going to be in the book of Job, and in the second chapter, we'll be beginning there. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we begin. Father, tonight we're grateful and thankful for this opportunity to gather together with the people of God around the Word of God and to the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, tonight I pray that you would challenge our hearts from the things we're about to note and study. 
Lord, that we would continue to be serious students of the Word of God, true disciples, not only those that hear the Word, but become doers of the Word. And I pray tonight, Lord, if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that is unsaved, I pray that you would convict them of their sin and their need of Christ, that they might believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. And now tonight I pray that I could speak with humility, with grace, wisdom, conviction, and passion, that I might take the knowledge you've given me, make it clear and accurate, and that I might speak with the authority that your word deserves. So I pray that you bless us now, use this message by the power of your spirit to speak to our hearts, give us what we need, Lord, to continue on this journey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. So tonight we're going to continue in looking at the subject of Satan's offensive strategy against believers and his attack on believers. We want to review a couple things. So let's put our first point up on the board just by way of a quick review, and then we'll get into tonight's portion. Uh, Satan attacks spiritually mature believers that God presents as witnesses, evidence against him. Uh, human history is Satan's appeal trial. Satan is getting an opportunity to prove that he can be like the Most High. God, as the prosecutor, presents witnesses. Satan has the right to cross-examine these witnesses. Um, Satan himself does not pay much attention to most believers. His minions do. He has a table of organization, the principalities and power and spiritual wickedness in high places and demons spirits who do his bidding and they're part of his organization and they will harass believers but you know many times we say the devil is after me or the devil did this to me really it's not Satan himself that did anything to us most of the time it's people made bad decisions and they're suffering for their own bad decisions but if it is undeserved, it's not, it's not Satan himself unless you have grown to a tremendous height of spiritual growth and are having a great impact against Satan's kingdom. It, Satan knows Paul, Satan knows Daniel, Satan knows Moses, Satan knows Job. You know, hopefully someday he'll know us if we keep growing, okay? But he doesn't personally attack believers unless... God has presented those believers as witnesses against him. But we know what we mean by that. We're better off saying the kingdom of darkness is after me or the kingdom of darkness is opposing me because it is not really Satan himself. And that's just a point of clarity and a point of doctrine that we want to be clear about. So if we feel like we're suffering undeservedly and it's an attack uh, from the enemy, we should say, it's the kingdom of darkness that has come against me, or Satan's minions. It's not really Satan himself, okay, for the most part, for, for the overwhelming majority of Christians. But nonetheless, Satan does instruct his minions to what? Attack believers, right? He's got the word out to the lower-ranking angels and demons. See these believers who are starting to grow? See these believers who are starting to have an impact, you get out there and you harass them. You do something to stop their impact. You do something to deter their spiritual growth. Are you with me so far? Okay, next point. Let's go quickly. Spiritually mature believers who are having an impact on the kingdom of darkness qualify for evidence testing against Satan. Satan has the right to cross-examine the witnesses for the prosecution in his appeal trial. Uh, he's trying to prove that he can be like the Most High. He has many arguments that he uses against God. And uh, God presents witnesses. Job was one of those witnesses, and uh, Satan had the right to cross-examine him. And that's what the attack on Job was all about, a very spiritually mature man, a man who qualified to be evidence against Satan, a witness in the appeal trial in the courtroom of heaven. When it was in session, God presented Job, Satan said he only serves you because how you bless him. If you take it all away, he'll curse you to your face. The Lord said you can, you can do that, but you can't touch his body. Next point, if we'll put it up on the board. 
Job's resignation to God's will demonstrates his depth of spiritual maturity and love for God. He lost everything. He lost everything. But he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Thither the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he did not sin or charge God foolishly, and he worshipped God, even in his grief and mourning. He worshipped God. He passed the test. He proved under cross-examination from Satan to be a reliable and trustworthy witness of great character. And it takes humility and submission to God to accept his sovereignty and omnipotent wisdom in whatever he allows or sends into our lives. As Job did, we must bow humbly before God's omnipotent sovereignty. You say, Pastor, that's a lot. That's a mouthful. What's all that about? It's simply this. God's the boss. God determines what comes into our life. Nothing can touch our life unless God permits it. If God permits it, we humbly, instead of fighting and grumbling and griping about it, we accept it. We're going to see, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, that Israel in the wilderness lost the opportunity of gaining their inheritance in the promised land. And one of the reasons they did, there was many that Paul gave, but one that was a special was they were uh, continually murmuring, complaining, griping, and re rebelling against God and, and spiritual authority. So we got to realize that if we get into the habit of complaining about our circumstances and griping about our circumstances and becoming bitter against God because of our circumstances, we are going to forfeit, forfeit a blessing. And if we continue in that, and that's the pattern of our whole spiritual life, we will be saved but as by fire and forfeit our inheritance in his kingdom. Uh, we'll look at that in the future when we get back to that passage in Corinthians. Okay, so here we have Job who was willing to humbly accept what God allowed. Naked I came out, naked I returned. The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. He bowed before God's omnipotence and his sovereignty. He said God has the right as the creator to do whatever he deems fit in my life. But let me tell you this, God never allows anything in your life just to hurt you. Many times he allows painful circumstances because he's going to use those circumstances to change us, to teach us things that we could have never learned, to correct things about us that we didn't even see about ourselves, and to teach us how to trust him in difficult places and depend on him and be humble before him so that ultimately his purpose in the suffering is to bring blessing to us. He will bring us out and he will bring blessing if we handle the suffering properly. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. Then Job attacked, was attacked by Satan. Again, uh, Job had a right to recall the witness and cross-examine him again and... Uh, he said, hey, listen, you know, skin for skin. You know, yeah, you took property away from him, but you take his health away, attack his body, and he'll curse you to your face. And then what happened? Job became afflicted terribly, ulcerous sores, itching constantly, loss of appetite, his facial skin degenerative changes. He became depressed, weak. He lost his physical strength. The worms came and started to chew on the boils and the pus. He had these running, oozing sores. His, his breathing became heavy and difficult. There was dark rings under his eye. His breath was foul. He began to lose an awful lot of weight. He, his bones were continually aching him. He could not sleep. He had insomnia and restlessness. His skin began to be blackened and peeled, and he suffered a fever. So you think you, you're going through stuff like Job, huh? Not. Job, this is what he endured, and this is where we're at. And then his wife comes, and the one that he depended on to support him turned what? Against him. And we're going to look at this tonight, because Satan will use people, especially people who are close to you, to try to get you to turn away from God, to try to get you to be bitter against God, or just to plain old distract you from God, 
to a worldly, carnal, fleshly solution to your problem. You have to be careful when you're going through suffering, when you're going through trials. You have to be careful to the voices that you listen to. Even people that love you dearly can give you bad advice, okay? The only voice that you need to listen to when you're going through suffering and trial is the voice of God. It's great when you can get godly counsel, but make sure it's godly counsel from a mature Christian based upon what? The Word of God. Ultimately, the only voice that you need to hear when you're going through suffering and trial is God's voice. And uh, Job passed this test. His wife turned on him. He said, you're a foolish woman. You're speaking like a foolish woman. He didn't call her a foolish woman. He said, you're speaking as if you're a foolish woman. He said, we receive good at the hand of the Lord. Shall we not also receive evil? And he didn't sin. He passed the test again fantastically, even in all of his physical pain and suffering. And now we get to verse number... Let's look at 1 Peter first, before we look at verse 11. 1 Peter says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, and the thing you have to realize is a Christian could commit murder. David did, and so did Moses. Uh, Peter would not say, don't suffer as a murderer if it was impossible for a Christian to commit murder. Okay? It, is, it has happened, and it, and it can happen. And legalistic people who think if someone commits a bad sin, they couldn't be a Christian or they lost their salvation, just don't understand God's grace. A person who commits murder will suffer for it in life, but they can never lose salvation. And then it says, or as a thief. Christians can be thieves and steal. Or as an evildoer, get involved in all kinds of evil practices. Or as a busybody, and like I said last week, isn't it interesting that in these four horrible sins that Peter's talking about that you could suffer for, and by the way, this is deserved suffering, this is not undeserved suffering, he includes busybody with murder and a thief and an evildoer. Because in the big seven that you find in Proverbs that God hates, God hates he or she that sows discord among the brethren. A busybody is someone who runs around and sticks their nose in other people's business and then goes around, what, carrying rumors and talking and slandering and gossiping. And it isn't amazing that God says that gossiping tongue is just as bad as the murderer, the thief, or the evildoer. Isn't that amazing? Some of these big-time gossips in churches wonder why they're always in trouble, why they're always having, they'll say, the devil's after me. No, he ain't. You're doing a good enough job of screwing it up yourself with your big, fat mouth that you're, and your big, fat nose that you're sticking everybody else's business where it doesn't belong. And they wonder, why am I in the hospital again? Why did I get fired from that job again? Why are there needs that are unmet? How come God's not hearing my prayers? Because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. But some of these foolish people, I've seen a bunch of foolish women like this in my life. I've seen a few foolish men that just don't know when to shut their mouths and mind their own business. It's called the doctrine of live and let live and the doctrine of MYOB. Mind your own business and let people live their lives before the Lord. Anyways, don't suffer for the... In other words, what Peter's saying is, look, there's no glory in suffering for things you deserve to suffer for. There's no blessing in that. Hopefully you learn from something from it, but there's no, you don't glorify God by suffering for things you did that were what? Wrong. Verse 16... And number 16, you got that coming up? First Peter 4, yep. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, now what's he saying? He's basically saying to suffer as a Christian means you suffer undeservedly. You suffer undeservedly. You suffer for doing the right thing. Right? That's what he's talking about. Let him slash her not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Listen, listen, when you're going through suffering, you know, Listen, people are going to learn. This is why people got to shut their mouth. Well, well, do you know what happened to sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so? Well, they must have some secret sin in their life. That's why they're going through this. Mind your own business. Pray for them. Show some compassion. 
Listen, if they did wrong, God will certainly show them the reason what, why they're suffering. But maybe they ain't done wrong, and you don't know everything about it, so just shut up. Mind your own business. Be a friend. Pray for them. Help them if you can. Okay? Because I'm going to tell you what, if God is correcting them with the rod, and you open your big mouth, he might decide, you know what, instead of whooping them, I'm going to give you a whooping for your gossiping mouth. Okay? And I wouldn't want that to happen to me. I don't know about you. i got enough trouble keeping myself straight. I don't need to get whooped for somebody else's troubles. Okay? Now look here, it says, but don't be ashamed. In other words, everybody goes through things. Everybody suffers. We're human. We all got troubles. We all got heartaches. We all got burdens. We all got problems. And we all got things that we know, yeah, that's my fault, and I'm suffering for it. Because we're what? Human. We're human. So don't be ashamed, just what? What does it say? But let him glorify God on this behalf. In other words, if you're suffering for doing the right thing, don't worry what people are saying. Because people can look at you. Job suffered for doing the right thing. And as we're going to see in a moment, his friends came, and instead of comforting him, basically what they did is what? Said, well, Job, the real reason you're suffering is because you've got secret sin in your life. And you're really a hypocrite. Nobody can see it, but that's why God's getting even with you now. Right? And that was the farthest thing from the truth, right? And it, it could have been very easy. Job went from living in the palace, the ranch with the 7,000 cattle and the 3,000 sheep and all the hundreds of servants and the, you know, everything he had to living in what? The garbage dump, the town dump, the trash heap, scraping his body with broken what? Pottery to get rid of the itching and the pus. He could have been very ashamed of how much and how far he had fallen. But let me tell you something. When God's, when, I'm going to tell you something. When God wants to deal with you and humble you and teach you things, and you're going through testing, and if, and if Satan's minions and the kingdom of darkness are after you, you may go to some difficult places, and you may lose some things. You can lose friendships and people. You can lose uh, finances. You can lose... Homes, you can lose property, okay? And people can even attack your reputation. But I'm going to tell you one thing you can't lose is Jesus. He said, I'll never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. So, but don't you be ashamed when you know I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm trusting God. And if I've got to let some stuff go, and if it's got to go, don't worry, God will take care of me. God will take care of me because he promised to supply all my needs. And it says, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And so what's the point? The point is this. If undeserved suffering should come, and we're suffering as a Christian, and we know we're doing right and we don't deserve this, use it to glorify God. In other words, recognize that it's a test because you're doing the right thing the kingdom of darkness is attacking you. Don't be ashamed of what's happening to you. You stand up and you trust God. And God will take you through and God will provide for you and God will ultimately deliver you completely and bless you. And you would have, you would have glorified God because rather than running off to the world for a solution to your suffering, rather than complaining and griping against God because of what you're suffering, rather than listening to the wrong voices and, and their attacks against you, you chose to continue to do right and trust God with your circumstance. You didn't curse his name, you didn't complain, you didn't become bitter, you didn't become gripe, griper. And you believed his word and he took you through because there may have been weeping, for the night, but joy cometh in the what? In the morning. God will not leave you there. It's only a what? Season, if necessary, if need be. Okay, so now let's move on over to Job chapter 2, verse 11. So we have in our undeserved suffering, we have an opportunity to glorify God. We make the choice, though. We make the choice. Listen, folks, uh, you're going to see this when we get back to Israel next Sunday, not this Sunday. 
don't make a habit of being a complainer, a murmurer of the Bible calls it, a griper, because that will bring you to the place because it's the opposite of faith. You know, when things aren't going your way and you're doing right, just trust God and use it as an opportunity to glorify him. It glorifies God when you're able to say, you know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Came into this life naked and didn't take anything with me. I'm taking nothing out with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I received evil. A good at the hand of the Lord, shall I not also receive evil? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just keep trusting him. That's what God's looking for. God will reward that and honor that and ultimately bless you. Verse 11, Job now has got done basically correcting his wife, rebuking her for her insensitivity and her unbelief. And we look at verse 11, and it says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz uh, the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite, and he was the shortest man in the Bible. You know that old joke, right? He was only shoe height. No. Silly. And, <laughs> and Zophar the Namathite. For they had man, made an appointment together to come mourn with him and to comfort him. Now later on, Elihu would show up. Okay? Now, these are very close friends of Job, and, and they had the best of intentions at the start, right? And when they heard about what happened, they, they called each other, they made contact with each other, and they got together and they said, let's go visit our friend Job, and let's, you know, let's go to comfort him and to mourn with him because he's suffering great, great loss here. Okay, it's terrible what's happened, and we want to be there for him. So they started off with the best of intentions, right? And then we're not going to have the time in this study to go verse by verse through all the discourses that they made. But what we do know is, is this very clearly, that they started off by sitting there with him quietly as he was in silence, grieving and suffering. And they should have just stopped right there and just said, what can we do to comfort him? Never mind all this jibber-jabbering and trying to figure out why this is happening to you, Job, and giving you, you know, the worst thing in the world is when you're going through suffering is to have people come at you and start quoting Bible verses at you and tell you, hey, this is what's happening, you know? And it's, it, sometimes they could be correct. Most of the time they're not. But what you need at that point is you just need comfort. You need to know that somebody cares, that somebody what? understands and you need a little encouragement and the best thing you can do for people sometimes when they're going for suffering is just love them just sit with them if they want to talk listen to them and if you can do something to ease their pain do it if you can help them in some way and make their circumstance better then do it show the love of Christ but what happened is Job's friends ended up, they started off with the right intention, and then they started opening their mouths. And uh, they assumed to know what God was up to in Job's life. This is a dangerous thing. And they did not end up comforting him, even though they started with good intentions. Ultimately, they began to accuse him of secret sin. And they're basically saying, you're a hypocrite, and you're basically just reaping what you sow. And Job's friends became cold and judgmental. Ultimately, they offered no comfort to Job. Ultimately, they offered no encouragement. They did not ease his burden. And they were wrong about the reason that Job was suffering. And we could take a few lessons, take at least two from this. We could take many. We'll take a couple for tonight for our purposes, and I want to just mention. And the first lesson is this. 
when other people are going through suffering, be very cautious and careful how you judge God's dealings with others. Now, I, I, I talk to believers lots of times, and they tell me what's going on in their life. And uh, it stays between me, them, and God. If they want to share it, so be it. And I listen, and, tr and I try to listen. And one of the most important things to do is to, because we're human, you know what happens when you start listening to someone's story. Immediately, if they say certain things, it triggers, well, hey, maybe this is why that's happening. And it could be good or bad. You know, it doesn't mean you're condemning them. It could just mean that you're saying this is why that's happened. But what I found out is don't do that. Let people talk. Let them say what's on their mind, what's on their heart. Try to give them some scriptures that comfort them. Okay? And if they bring something up that, they, that God shows them at that moment, and it's in agreement with the word, say, well, yeah, that could be it, you know. Don't be dogmatic with people. And I've also learned this. I've been in situations where I've seen this person is making horrible decisions, and they're going through some tough things, and it, it, I can see they're hurting. But it's better for them to learn than for me to try to point out all their faults. <laughs> Let them learn. Let God deal with them. And sometimes a, a brother or sister, they're not doing anything wrong, and they're suffering undeservedly. But God's still working, and I don't know everything he's doing, so it isn't up to me to be dogmatic and say, hey, this is what's going on in your life. Be an encouragement. Pray for them. Help them and encourage them to believe God's word, because that's what's ultimately going to what? Get them through. But the thing that I want you to take is this. Love people. Listen. We've all made mistakes. We've all screwed up. We've all made bad decisions. We've all suffered for things we've done. And we've all probably gone through suffering that we didn't deserve, too. But suffering is suffering, whether we deserved it or didn't. What is the most important thing we need to feel or sense in suffering? Some encouragement, right? Hope. Comfort. The, the, the idea that someone cares. You know, that we're not alone. And what we need to do as Christians is love people. Love them. Even if they messed up and, and you can see, it, yeah, it's very clear that this is just reaping what you sow, but love them anyway. Love them anyway. That's what God's calling us to do. And be, here's the thing I want to point to you. Be cautious and careful how you judge God's dealings with others. We don't always know what God's up to. We can surmise in our minds, and you know, it may be true, but be careful when you're dealing with people face to face. I, I, I will often rather let them learn the lesson themselves. Don't try to dogmatically tell them, here's what the problem is, here's why, and here's what God's doing. Because Really? Do we really know all that? No. Sometimes there's stuff going on that we don't even understand. So the first thing is this. You don't always know what God's up to in someone's life. Job's friends really didn't know what God was up to, right? They didn't know what God was going on. What would the best thing they could have done at that point? Just shut up, right, and comfort them and show them some love, right? Do something to ease his burden. And here's the second thing. And this is very important for us. The first point I just made is about how should we treat others who are suffering. Listen, love, show concern, don't judge. And if you can do something to help them, help them, right? That's showing the love of Christ. That's a good work that we can do, that God would be pleased with. And the second thing is for us. Suppose we're going through suffering. And I want us to understand this second point very carefully. When you are going through suffering, your ultimate comfort and encouragement in suffering does not come from people. Did you hear me? When you're going through suffering 
and you're going through adversity and testing, your ultimate comfort and encouragement in the suffering is not going to come from people. Now, it's nice when people can come and, you know, show you love and listen to you, and that's what we should do, right, towards our brethren. But here's the thing. That can only take you so far when you're in suffering. If you need people to be there to get you through, then you're not growing in the Lord like you need to grow. Because many times God puts us in the suffering and then he kind of strips away a lot of stuff and a lot of people because he's trying to teach us to depend on him for our comfort, to depend on him for our encouragement, to believe his word because we don't have anybody or anything else to turn to. And ultimately, there's going to be times where you're going through suffering and there's people around you and they're good to you and they make you feel comfortable and comforted and they encourage you. Maybe they even do things for you to help you. But ultimately, even with all that, you know there are those lonely moments and those lonely hours where there's only you and God. You may have wonderful family, you may have wonderful friends, you may have wonderful brethren in the church, and they're all there to really comfort you, and they, they love you. But even with all that, that's not going to get you through. It kind of helps you, it, it, it gives you a little momentum, it encourages you, but what's going to get you through? Because there, there's going to be times where there's just you and God. Lonely moments, lonely hours, lonely days, lonely weeks where there's no one there. Or maybe there are people there, but then there's times you're just alone. How are you going to be encouraged now? If you need people to keep you going, you're not going to go very far. Ultimately, in suffering, what God is trying to teach us in our lonely, isolated places, in the places where we seem to be in the obscure place, God is trying to teach us to depend upon him. Andre Crouch sang a song, Through It All. That was old school gospel, back in the day when gospel was about inspiration, you know, not profit. Today, a lot of contemporary Christian music is about profit. It's not about inspiration. But he was, made a song through it all. And uh, he said, you know, if I never had a problem, I'd never know what God, that God could solve them. And I would never know what faith in his word could do. There comes a place where God wants us to depend on him and learn that his promises are real and they're true and that we can depend on them. And that draws us closer to who? God. In a way that we can So many people say, I want to be close to God. I've been praying that the Lord will reveal himself to me and, and make me closer to Jesus. I, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be closer to Jesus. I want God to show himself to me. And then the next thing you know, they're going through some what? Suffering and pain. And adversity. And why, why is this happening? I wanted to be close to God. Well, God's answering your prayer. You see? You cannot become like Jesus or get close to Jesus unless you go through some of the things that Jesus went through. A man of sorrows acquainted with the bitterest of grief who suffered. And learned obedience through the things he suffered in his humanity. And how are you going to learn to trust God unless you never have giants before you that you have to conquer? And all you've got is his promise and nothing else to hang on to. Let me show you a, a verse. First, uh, let's, let's look at a few verses. First Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 6, if you'll turn there. 
1 Samuel chapter 30. All right. And when you get to chapter 30, I'm going to look at verse 1. I'm going to read an interesting circumstance. As you grow in the Lord, you start getting closer to the Lord. You start to know the Lord. You know his ways. You have a history with God. You know God brought me through this, and God brought me through that, and I had that circumstance, and I trusted him, and he took me through. He proved himself to me. Remember, he said that to Israel, prove me. In other words, trust me and see what I can do because I'll prove myself faithful to you. One of the greatest things that happens when you go through suffering and you trust God is you get a greater confidence in God because you went through something hard. You had nowhere to turn except God. You believed his word, and he took you through and he delivered you, and he blessed you. And now God has proven himself faithful to who? You personally. You heard the pastor say how God was faithful to him. You heard the missionary say how God was faithful to him. You heard the, the grandma talk about things she went through and how God was faithful to her. But now you've been through something, and you had to trust God, and Jesus proved himself faithful to who? You. You can't get that if you don't go through anything. And so you get to the place where you're in a place that Job is suffering. And Job's ultimate comfort would have to come from who? God. Because in, in this situation, his friends weren't any what? Any good. They weren't any use. They made his burden greater, Right? All they brought was condemnation and judgmentalism, right? And a lot of, I'm sure after a while it just became wah, 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 you know? That's not what I need in that place. I need real encouragement, real comfort. And ultimately I want to say something to you. When you're growing in the Lord, you learn to bring your burdens to God. It's nice when people are there, don't get me wrong, but you can't depend on people. Even the best people are human. And a human being is not omnipotent, and a human being is not omnipresent and omniscient. And ultimately, they can help you, but only a little bit. Who's going to really help you? Only sovereign, all-powerful, all-wise God who is what? Ever-present in every situation. It's the only one. David, circumstance here. And it's a circumstance. He's out with his men and his mighty men. They're out trying to carry out some raids and bring back some food and other types of material necessities and maybe hunting. And then verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag. That's where he had when he was running from Saul and he was living as a refugee and Saul was hunting him down, uh, David, did, did David deserve Saul's attacks and jealousies? No. David never did nothing to Saul. Saul was jealous. Saul was out to kill David, okay? Keep him from the throne. And so David is out at Ziklag. That's his outpost. He, it's a little village. Uh, him and his men and their wives and their children. They make Ziklag their home. It's a, it's a place where they're kind of on the frontier and they can kind of uh, protect themselves and be safe, And they thought, right, from Saul and his men. And it says uh, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So the Amalekites, while David and his men left their families to go out to get provisions, the Amalekites took advantage in what? Attacked Ziklag, burnt it to the ground, and carried away all what? Their women and children and their property. 
and their intention would be to enslave them, make them their what? Servants. And then verse 3, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Now they come home from their expedition, and when they get home, what do they see as they're coming towards uh, Ziklag, you know, uh, the small city, as they're coming to it, they see the, the, the smoke, and they see the embers burning, and they see everything that they had worked hard to build to provide for their families is now what? Destroy. Suppose you came home from work today and your house was burnt to the ground and you didn't have insurance. Even if you had insurance, it's, it's, it's still no joy. All precious possessions in there and things that meant so much to you are now what? Gone. And then you find out that your children and your, your wife or your husband is gone too. How would you feel? Well, imagine what David and his men felt like. They came back and their families have disappeared. And everything they owned and all that they had worked for was now what? Burnt to the ground. Nothing but ashes. And then it gets even better for David. Not, you know, it ain't like he hadn't suffered enough to this point. Look at verse 5. For, and David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and, and they wept until they had no more power to weep. They were grieving. It was a horrible, gun. where are they? What's happened to them? And look what everything we own and possess is gone. Tragic. And then it gets worse in, in verse 5. And David's two wives were taken captive. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Here's what happens, human nature. All his men turned on David. On, on top of losing all his property, losing his wives and his children and not knowing what has become them and where they are, then all his men who have wept with him and grieved with him now turn on him and say, and it's all your fault, David. And they say, let's kill him. Because he's the leader, he's responsible. This wouldn't have happened unless he had made these decisions to leave and go forth on this expedition. Now David is getting blamed for what? The problem, right? Well, there was no one for David. His wives were gone, his children were gone. His brothers and his father Jesse, they were distant. They didn't know nothing about this. There was nobody. There was no human being to comfort him. The ones that he had wept with that he would have thought are going to at least be there with me and we'll grieve together and we'll work together and we'll comfort one another till we get through this, they turned on him. And now he's alone. But he's really not alone, right? He's not alone. Look what it says. Because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters, and they blamed what? David. But look what it says here, the last part of that verse, verse 6. David had nowhere else to turn and nobody else to turn to, but he was not alone. The Apostle Paul said, when I stood before Caesar, all forsook me. But the Lord stood what? By me and strengthened me. And look what it says. It said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And you know, David would ascend to the throne one day. Uh, he would receive great riches and 
blessing and prosperity, and he also made some bad decisions along the way. But in many ways, his life was fantastically blessed. His kingdom was fantastically blessed. His son Solomon would build the temple and the, the glory that Israel experienced and no other kingdom in the world would ever, has ever experienced. It's said of Solomon's day, David's son, that you know the gold was like the rocks in the street. There was so much of it around, okay? But David's greatness is not determined by, when, by how he was able to scale the great heights of power and wealth and prominence and fame. David's greatness was determined by when he was down and alone and had no one to turn to but God, and he held on to who? God. He, this, to me, when I read the Bible, and this is what's so sad about all this prosperity garbage that's being preached in Christianity today on Christian television and radio. These, these preachers who are preaching for money and these mega churches and it's all about glitz and glamour and say the right things and don't preach about the hard things and don't challenge people and be politically correct and all this nonsense. This is greatness. David is alone. He's lost everything. All the world is against him. But he encourages himself in the Lord his God. He knows his God. God has promised us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Since God be for me, who can be against me? He will cause all things to work together for them that what? Love him. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And at this moment, this is when David, one of those moments, and there was a couple others in the cave of Adullam when he was all alone in the cave, and he wrote Psalm 103. This is David at his greatest. Do you know, I'm going to tell you something. The greatest points in my life have not been when I've got up here and preached this sermon and everybody said, what a great message, it touched me. Or I got saved today, Pastor, from your message. Or what a way, what a powerful explanation of that truth. Those are not the great moments. The great moments have been when I have been down and out and alone with no one to turn to but God. And that's when you'll be at your greatest if you trust him. You are at your greatest when everything is against you and you still proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and you trust him. You say, Lord, it hurts, it's difficult, but I believe your word and I praise your name. I praise your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you know, the thing that's awesome here is David actually encouraged himself. He got encouragement from the Lord. You say, how does that happen? Well, let me close with this tonight. Turn to Psalm 94, if you will. You'll never be greater in your walk with God than when you have all the odds against you and you're alone with nobody except God. And if you choose to believe God and to praise him and to trust him and to bow before him and depend on him, God will come by his word and encourage your heart. We have got to learn to draw our ultimate encouragement and motivation from God himself through his word. God has said some things. Look at, you got Psalm 94, please? Verse number 17. Psalm 94, look at verse 17. <laughs> Why 
unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. What's he saying? What is the multitude of thoughts? You know when everything's against you and you're going through hardship and you're experiencing suffering and pain and you don't see the answers and it, 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 it doesn't, it, it doesn't, isn't clear what's, what's the way to turn. It could, maybe some confusion sets in. You know the thoughts Satan puts in your mind. Satan will come and he will remind you, not Satan himself, obviously, but his kingdom of darkness, and they will remind you of every what? Bad thing that could happen. Get in a tough place where you're going through some suffering, and the enemy will give you every scenario about how bad it's going to be to discourage you. Because where's the battle fought? Where's the battle of faith fought? In the what? Mind. That's why the Bible says, renew your mind with his word. And when, when you're in that place of suffering and the multitude of thoughts start, all the negative thoughts of all the bad things that are happening and could happen and have happened, if you focus, your, if your mind is focused on these thoughts, then the kingdom of darkness will discourage you and bring you to depression and bring you to the place of darkness. This is why many people, when they go through tremendous suffering, they want to just quit and throw in the towel. But notice what he said. How do you get encouragement instead of discouragement? He said, Thy comforts delight my soul. Now here, as we close, and don't miss this. What does he mean when he says, thy comforts delight my soul? What are God's comforts? God's comforts are the promises of his word. What is he saying? When the kingdom of darkness is attacking me, and the multitude of the negative thoughts are building up in my soul, and I'm feeling overwhelmed and fearful and confused and full of doubt, and I'm so discouraged. I'm so discouraged. What is going to comfort me? What is it that is going to comfort me? The comfort comes from the Word of God. The comfort comes from the Word of God. Romans 15, 13, last verse. David was able to encourage himself in the Lord because he knew God's Word. He knew God's promises. He knew that God was with him. He knew that God would never forsake him. And he knew that God had an answer for his situation. And he was able to focus Here's the problem with many people. They're scatterbrains. What? They're scatterbrains. Their thoughts are here, there, everywhere, all over the place. And they, they never take the time to seriously focus on what does God's word say. They hear sermons, but they hear, they hear it through a filter that doesn't, receive it all. They don't absorb it all. And that leaves them unprepared for what? The time of testing. There's, there's no way to encourage themselves because they haven't built the soul structure of his truth right here. But if we're paying attention to what the past is teaching, and if we're learning the word of God seriously, then we have stored in our soul the promises and the principles and the truths of God's word right here. And now when we're in this place of testing, 
We can encourage ourselves when no one else is there to encourage us. Why? We begin to focus on what God has said. We tune out. We shut off all the other voices and even the negative thoughts in our own mind. And we begin to focus on what has God said about my circumstance. Romans 15 and 13. If you got that, it says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. How do we have peace and joy in the midst of suffering? How do we have encouragement in the midst of the storm? By believing the Word of God. And when we believe the Word of God, the Holy Spirit within us will give us joy and peace because we are focusing upon what God has said. You know, folks, uh, I've been in places in my life where I just got tired of living in fear. I just got tired of living in doubt. I just, I got tired of focusing on all the negative stuff that had happened and could possibly happen and was happening. And I just got to the point where I said, you know what, I got two choices here. I can give in to the negativity and the multitude of thoughts that is trying to take over my what? Soul, or oh Lord, I can believe what you said. Now Lord, I got nobody and nothing else but this book. And I got nothing else, Lord, right now but this word. And I'm going to focus on what you have told me, Lord. You have told me. I've been in some dark, dark places. So dark that I, I never thought there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But in those times, I had encouragement and comfort from God because of the word of God that I had stored here. Let me tell you something. When my life is done and I look back one day, it, it won't be, oh, you know, the church was successful. Well, you got 5,000 hours of sermons on, you know, video if people want them. You wrote a few books. What will, what will be my greatest, personally, personally, my greatest moments will be those times that were the worst in my life and the darkest. And all I had was a promise from God's word. And God honored his promise and comforted me and brought me through. Those are the greatest moments in our lives, folks. Those are the greatest moments. Shipwrecked on God and stranded on his omnipotence. <laughs> on the island of God's omnipotence. Shipwrecked on him. Nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn only him. These are our greatest moments. Tonight, I want to say this, God's word is true. Choose to believe him. Choose to believe him. He will fill you with joy and peace by the Holy Spirit. And keep your mind focused on what God says and tune out all the other what? Noise. You hear me? Tune it out. All the other voices focus on God's word. Our greatest encouragement comes from him. Let's bow our heads from prayer.
Father, tonight we're so grateful and so thankful that we have had this time to spend in your word. And I pray tonight that you would indeed challenge our hearts, Lord, to seek our encouragement from you, to stand upon your word, to believe your word, to focus upon your word, and to tune out the negative thoughts, to read to resist the attacks of the kingdom of darkness against our mind and to tune out all the voices, Lord, except your voice as you speak to us through your spirit and your word. And Lord, tonight I pray that you'd encourage our hearts to go forward. Trust you, Lord, in all things. Dedicate the last moment of the service tonight to anyone here, if you're not saved, anyone watching through the live stream or in the future through technology. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now in the privacy of your own heart and your own mind, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I do believe. that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior and my Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's take a moment of silence. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart, and if they have believed upon the Lord Jesus, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've forgiven them, saved them. Pray that you would reveal your love to them in a special way, and I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we depart tonight, I pray that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, it has been a pleasure. Have a great night. Guys, uh, don't forget, if you're coming on out, 545 Town Hall Lanes for some bowling and fellowship on Friday evening. Have a great night.